Uh, we're going to move right along. We're going to move right along in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Um, we had left off last week. We left off last week with Paul's admonition to the church to be careful not to chase after the wisdom of the world. To be careful not to chase after the wisdom of the world. And, and Paul, he painted this picture for us. He painted this picture for us that, that we are members of the body of Christ. And if you remember, that word member here is not to speak of uh, being part of an organization. It's not about membership in that sense. You know, you pay your dues and your name's on a roster. The word member there literally means a limb, a body part. And so we are, we are the limbs of the body of Christ. And, and he paints this picture for us. Paul paints this picture for us that if we are to join with the world... To join with the world is folly, right? To join in the world in the folly of its so-called wisdom, that's akin to joining yourself physically to a harlot, to a prostitute. And, and it's not, that's something that you would never do, I trust, but it's especially disturbing in the context of a marriage, because there is a sanctity of marriage. You, you are betrothed to your spouse. There is a commitment. And there is a, it's, it's, it's rather a graphic picture, I think. Right? You know, a man and woman, they're called to be joined. The two shall become one. You, you got to be one with Christ. You got to be one in the body. To join yourself to the world, that, that's a pretty gross thing to do. And so Paul gives us this really, I think, a rather graphic illustration of what it means to be part of the body. But I think, I think it drives a point home. Right? I don't think Paul ever, um, you know, takes things as far just for the sake of, you know, being edgy and being woke. No, he's driving a point home that, look, you are either with one or the other. You are either with the body of Christ or you are joined with the world. There is no middle ground. And, and so, and then Paul continues on. Paul continues on while he's on the topic of man and woman being called together to be joined together in marriage by God. He goes on to answer some questions that the church in Corinth had for him. Now, you know, may, maybe this was like the dear Abby of the day, you know, and they would write a letter and Paul would answer, um, except that it's not Abby, it's Paul. Now, we don't have the letter. We don't have the letter or the letters that were written to Paul that he's responding to. But I think as we look at his answer, we can get a little bit of context from, from his answer, what was asked. Right? So here we are today, this morning, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So if you have your Bibles or your phones, turn there, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And he starts, the, the, the chapter starts with this. I almost said he starts a chapter. He's not starting a chapter. He's still writing the letter, right? But the division of the letter that we have just so happens that this chapter starts with this in verse 1. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me. So he's, he's answering a question that they wrote to him. Concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. And taken out of context which some people will do. They'll take the Bible and they'll take a verse out of context. Taking this one verse out of context may seem like an odd thing to say. Right? Yeah, it's, it's sensible, really, because you really shouldn't go around touching anyone, especially you know, if, if you're a man, you shouldn't go around touching a woman. Um, that, that's abuse. Don't do that, right? But, but reread it in context. We are going to read it in context. So we were going to read verses 1 and 2 together. Now, concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. This is talking about marriage. Paul is addressing marriage, right? He's not just talking about randomly touching people, but he's saying in, in terms of marriage, if it can be helped, and if you read the rest of the chapter, Paul says this, if it can be helped, it's best to keep your distance between members of the opposite sex. If you can do it, if the Lord has given you that ability, it is better to keep your distance. Now, I remember... You know, hearing how at Christian schools, um, you know, they, they don't have prom, they don't have winter ball, they don't, they don't have dances, um, they have, uh, what is it, social gatherings, um, and, and at these 
Oh, but we know their dances, right? But at these Christian school dances, you know, I used to hear about this where you have to maintain a distance when you dance. I don't know if it was like a foot or whatever arm's length. Um, and, and some people have said, you got to leave room for the Holy Spirit to be there between the two of you. Whatever the case is, you got to keep some kind of distance, right? A foot, two feet. And, and you know, young people might say, oh, that's, that's strict. That's... That's archaic. Look, it's better than six feet. It's better than social distancing, right? But, but here's the thing. We are told by Paul here, if it can be helped, if it can be helped, don't touch a woman. Don't be in a relationship. But because I know you can't do it, then be in a marriage, be committed to one another. And we, know, we see clearly that Paul's talking about marriage. If you go down to verse 7, go down to verse 7. To nine, Paul says this, for I wish, I wish that all men were even as I myself. I wish you were all like me. You were able to do this. But each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. And so Paul, Paul kind of sums it up right there. If you cannot help it, then get married. Otherwise, you're just going to get into loads of trouble with temptation, with lust in your heart. Get married. All right? But if you can, if you can be not married, then do it if God's giving you that gift. Now, Paul actually goes on in this chapter. He does go into quite a bit of detail about what a Christian marriage should be like. And, and he, he makes a distinction as he writes this letter. He makes a distinction. Some of these things he writes, some of these things that I share are a commandment from the Lord. And these things, it's not for your consideration. A commandment from the Lord means he commands and you obey, you do it. But some of the things that he writes, he distinguishes it as not a commandment from the Lord, but his own advice. He says, this is my advice to you. And using my own judgment, I think this would be better for you to do. But he also reminds us that this advice isn't just coming from a whim, but he speaks as one who has the spirit of God. So in a sense, he's saying, look, the Lord is giving me this burden to give this advice to you. It's not a commandment. So if you can't do it, that's fine. But if you can, if you are able, then do these things that I tell you. Okay. Now, in Corinth, this letter is written to the, to the church in Corinth. And if you have to remember that in Corinth, as he's writing to this church, it is still a relatively new church. You know, most, I would say most of the believers there did not grow up in church. They did not grow up a Christian. They were new converts. And so picture, if you will, picture, if you will, a husband and wife. They were married. They're both non-believers living in Corinth, and one of them comes to know the Lord, repents, believes, and is saved. What happens to the other spouse? The other spouse, perhaps it is not their time, perhaps they never come to the Lord. We don't know, but the fact is that in, this, in, in the second letter to, to the church in Corinth, Paul actually speaks of this. He admonishes them not to be unequally yoked with non-believers. And this principle that he proposes there does apply to marriage. It, it applies to everything we do in life. You, know, you, you can't say, you know what, he didn't say specifically the word marriage, so it doesn't apply. It applies to everything we do in life not to be unequally yoked with a non-believer. And so here you go. Paul says, in everything you do, which includes marriage, don't be married to someone who's a non-believer. So what do you do then in that case? where a, a husband or a wife becomes a believer and now the two are unequally yoked. He actually addresses this. And in this chapter, he says, look, if you have a husband and wife and you were, the, the other person is an unbeliever, but you were already married and then you came to the Lord and you're unequally yoked because you became a believer, Paul says, stay together if you are able. Stay together. If the other person who is a non-believer is willing to stay with you, and sometimes they don't want to because now you believe in this God they don't believe in. and you're, This is why Paul says don't be unequally yoked. Once you have different masters, it is very hard to walk together side by side. 
When you have different goals in life, it is very hard together to walk side by side. And that's what marriage is. You got to walk side by side. The two become one. How can two become one and then to have one serve two masters? You cannot serve two masters. But Paul says, if the other spouse who is a non-believer is willing to stay with you, then stay together. Because he ends with this question, that section on, on this uh, unequally yoked marriage, he says, he ends with a question, how do you know whether you will save your spouse? You don't know, you might. And so stay together that perhaps through the way you exemplify Christ, someday your spouse comes to know Christ also. Then he goes on to say this. He says, basically what Paul is saying is, however you are now, whatever station in life you are in, continue to live that way. Not speaking about living sinfully, because we are called to repentance. We need to turn away from our sin, but our situation, our circumstance, whatever those things are, continue to live that way. And, and he gives a few examples. He says, if you're already circumcised, and some of the converts were Jewish converts. But if you were already circumcised, even though Paul says circumcision is not necessary, if you were already circumcised, don't long to be uncircumcised. If you're uncircumcised, there is no need to get circumcised so that you'll be saved. And then he goes on to say, if you were a slave, and there were slaves in that time, but if you were a slave to a master, that is your station in life, then don't be concerned about it. These are the words of Paul. Don't be concerned about it. But if you can be made free, by all means, be set free. And he says here in verse 23, you were bought at a price. Right? When he speaks of slavery, he, he brings it down to this. All of us, as we become believers, as we give our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, we are now a slave to a new master, a master who loves, a master who gives us a new freedom in our, our, our servitude to him. But you were bought at a price, Paul says, do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. Whatever circumstance you're in, this is what Paul's saying, whatever circumstance that you are in, don't become a slave to trying to change your circumstances. Whatever circumstance that you are in, when God called you to be saved, as you become saved, you have a new master now, Jesus Christ. So don't become a slave to trying to change the circumstances that you're in. Don't be mastered by your circumstances because you have a new master now. The, these things, these things that so often occupy our minds. I know it, you know it, because we've all experienced it. We are occupied with our status, our position, uh, how, how much money we have. All these things, these things don't matter. Paul says these things don't matter. Which brings me to the point that the Lord has been impressing in my heart this week that I want to share with you. It's not about marriage. What, what's been on my heart this week is not about marriage, but rather this, verse 29 to 31. Read with me if you will. 1 Corinthians 7, 29 to 31. But this I say, brethren, the time is short, so that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. Those who weep as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Those who buy as though they did not possess. And those who use this world as not misusing it, for the form of this world is passing away. Look, marriage is important. Marriage is important. In case anybody's going to go out there today and say, Jason doesn't care about marriage, marriage is important. So is dating. How you date is important. In that relationship, getting to know each other. Okay, I'm sidetracked now. But marriage, marriage is important. Paul cares very, very, very much about how we treat our spouse. And so when you read verse 29 here, when you read verse 29, you have to have an understanding of what Paul is conveying to us. Verse 29 says this, I'll read it again. But I say, brethren, the time is short so that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. 
Those who have wives should be as though they had none. Now again, when you take a verse out of context, when you take the Lord's word out of context, you can end up mis- not only misunderstanding it, but misusing it. Paul by no means is advocating here that we should not care or take care of our spouse or our family. Paul is not advocating that we don't take care of our spouse or family. Paul cares very, very much about the relationship between husband and wife. He cares very much about the relationship between parents and children. Husbands are called to what? To love their wives, how much or how? As Christ loved the church. And a lot of times we'll stop there. Yeah, yeah, Paul says, you know, love love your wives as, as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's the degree to which husbands are called to love their wives, that they would be willing to give themselves up for her. And he doesn't mean to say, oh, I give up, okay, fine. But to give yourself up, to lay down your claims to what you have a right to, you know, to, to, to put down the things that you want in, in, in life, to, to, to put your wife first. And that's, what, that's the degree to which we are called to love our wives to the husbands out there. So how do we reconcile these two statements? Love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, but from now on, live as though you don't have a wife. Right, so, so when you put these two together, you, you need to put everything together in context so that you understand what Paul's saying. You know, he come home from work, right? Those of you that are husbands on, on this, on this, that are here this morning. You come home from work, and, and your wife says, hey, honey, uh, can, you, can you help me install the shelf? Oh, I'm sorry, you know, this Sunday the, the, the pastor said I should live as though I have no wife, so you can't help you there. No, look, this is what Paul is talking about. He says, the time is short. The time is short. What do I mean by this? Look, I, I have some interest. I have some interest in looking at the prophecies in the book of Revelations and comparing that to what's happening in the world right now. Did you know, did you know right now, as I am speaking to you, as you are listening, did you know that right now, at this very moment, that there are swarms of locusts that are eating up to eating up up to 10% of the world's food supply. Did you know? Did you know that there, there is such a thing happening right now? As if we haven't had enough going on this year already, right? In in northern Kenya, there is a swarm currently in northern Kenya that covers that is big enough to cover the city of Paris. I haven't been to Paris. But I think, you know, the city of Paris is pretty big. The swarm in Kenya is of locusts. The, these, these insects that destroy crops. There is a swarm in Kenya that is large enough to cover the city of Paris. Oh, I missed something. It is large enough to cover the city of Paris 24 times. That's how large the swarm is. Did you know? Did you know that there is a pandemic sweeping the world? Okay, we all know. Did you know that there is civil unrest and there is division in, in our land about, about what are these injustices that are being done to people of color? Did you, yes, we all know that. The world, what is happening in the world? What is happening in the world? You know, it, it would be, on one hand, it would be very easy to, to look at all that's going on and to say, yeah, you know, here we go again. I, I remember, I remember when this happened and that happened in this time and that time. He, racial tension, this is nothing new. Some of you here might be old enough to remember and to have lived through the, the riots in Los Angeles, the Rodney King riots. I remember watching that unfold on TV, television. You know, it's this big screen where we used to watch our news. Nowadays, it's all on your phone. But we used to sit in front of TV and watch the news. And as a high schooler, watching the riots unfold, people coming out with, I mean, there were people who were fully armed. And this was, this was crazy to watch this unfold. This was 
I'm going to do the math real quick. 20 some years, almost 30 years ago. And so we can look at history and say that what is happening now, there's nothing new. It's just another cycle. It's just another cycle. And we can be desensitized to that. And so then the question comes up once in a while. Right? Somebody asked Alice's dad this, oh, Brother Z, based on what's happening, you know, do you think it's the end of the world? Is it the end times or not? I don't know. I don't know, but I, what I do know is this. What Paul says here to us this morning is that the time is short. The time is short. Are you married? Congratulations, I'm happy for you. Live as if you're not married. Care for your wife, but don't let your marriage be the all-consuming thing in your life. Care for your wife. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church that he gave himself up for her. But this should not be the only thing in your life. Should not be the be-all and end-all. That's what Paul means when he says live as though you, <coughs> you are not married. He goes on to say in verse 30, he says, are you... The question I have for you is, are, are you, this morning, as we're here this morning, are you sad? Are you burdened with sadness? Paul says in verse 30, to those who weep. If you're weeping this morning, this is what the Apostle Paul says to us. If you're weeping, those who weep, be as though they did not weep. Are you rejoicing in some good news this morning? To those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. I am reading straight from the Bible. This is what Paul wrote. And so the response is, oh, Paul, that is so cruel. Paul, why are you so cruel? Why? What a cruel thing to say. Doesn't he care? Thank you very much. Do, don't you care about how we feel? Don't you care about what's going on in our lives? He cares. He cares. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, Paul writes this, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. I, I didn't make that up. Paul addresses these two things very specifically. To the Corinthians, he says, If you're weeping, be as though you did not weep. If you're rejoicing, be as though you did not rejoice. But it's not that I don't care about these things. Because with those who are weeping, we should weep with them. And with those who are rejoicing, we should rejoice. So that is important. But don't let it consume you. Don't let it be the only thing that defines who you are, that defines what you live for. Because look, if you're weeping, and there are many things that we would be sad about today. Yes, you look at what's going on in the world and your heart should be broken. But if you let your weeping consume you and be the only thing in your life, it will be hard to get out of bed even. Because you open your eyes and the first thing you think of is, what is going on in this world that people would hate and kill each other? I can't live in this world. And we become consumed in our weeping and we can't face life. And then, and then we're not able to go out and make a difference. If you're rejoicing, if there's something in your life that you're rejoicing for, if that consumes you, then you, you, you become unaware of the things that are happening around us. And so Paul is very even keeled. Weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice. But if you're weeping, live as if you're not weeping. If you're rejoicing, live as if you're not rejoicing. Do those things, but don't let that be all that defines you. He cares about us, Paul. And the Lord, speaking through Paul. But he says, don't let these things consume you. In verse 30, going on, more examples for us. Those who buy as though they did not possess. I, I don't know um, if you guys have experienced this. You all own things, right? I don't think any of us have, have here have sold everything that we have and given it to the poor. We all own something. I don't know if you've experienced this where, you know, I... I I know a thing or two about being consumed by possessions. Because as I look back in my life, there have been different stages in my life where I have wanted different things. 
right? And some of you know, I, I used to be a photographer. I used to be really, really into cameras. The money that I spent on, on cameras, on DSLRs, on lenses, if I gave you a number today, if I put that number up on the screen, call now, no. If I gave you a number today of the amount of money that I spent on cameras and camera equipment, some lighting equipment that is still taking up room in our garage, precious, precious storage room. If I told you this morning how much I spent on all that stuff, you would probably spit your coffee out. Guitars, okay, guitar is good. They're used for ministry. But still, there was a time when I was so consumed with guitars and it was all I could think about. You know, I would have my sight set on, on this instrument that I want to get. And I would spend a lot of time researching what is good about it, what's not good about it. And then the funnest part for me is finding a place to buy it that has the best deal. Hunting, hunting, hunting for the best deal. Watching eBay and now there's Reverb.com. All these places, you know, searching high and low trying to find the best price to save a few dollars it consumed me I wake up and that's what I think about when I go to sleep that was what I was thinking about it consumed me those who buy as though you did not possess if you need something buy it and use it but live as if you don't even own that thing what does that mean I bought something. Oh, where did it go? Gosh, I'm pretending I don't own it. No, not like that. Buy it and use it, but don't let your ownership of that item consume you and define you and be all that you think about. Look, I can say these things because I am looking back now at the past, realizing how, how insane that was. The hard thing is to be able to look at and identify the now. What is it that I am consumed with now? And perhaps the Lord is speaking to some of you this morning. Let him speak. Don't shut his voice out. If he's, if he's directing your attention to an area in your life where you have allowed yourself to be consumed, then listen to that voice. And I don't think the Lord is saying, get rid of all that. But the Lord is saying, slow down. Temper yourself a little bit. Don't be completely given to that thing, right? Verse 31, those who use this world, that's what we all do. We all live in this world. We all use it. Those who use this world as not misusing it. What does that mean, not misusing it? Don't abuse this world. Don't, be, don't, don't go overboard in using this world. It's given to you to use. You... You are supposed to have dominion over these things. That was the order that God intended, that man would have dominion over this world. But what we have done is we have, we have relegated that, that dominionship, that, that, that position of authority over the world. We've given it to the world and we've said, come, I welcome you, my Lord and Master, small l, small m. To the world we say, I welcome you, my Lord and Master, come and consume me. That is misusing the world. That is Things going all out of order. The hierarchy has been turned upside down now. You are in control of the things of this world, the tools that have been given to you, not the other way around. Why, why, why does Paul say this? That last bit in verse 31, for the form of this world is here to stay forever. No, the form of this world is passing away. The form of this world is passing away. We make use of the things of the world, but make sure that we don't go into excess, right? Whatever we have at our disposal, understand these things are temporary, and they are here at, the, think of that word, it's at our disposal. Have you ever thought of that, what, what that word means? Yeah, we, we say it as, as in, yeah, it's here for me to use, disposal to be disposed of it is going to be gone at some point this is the way we should live all things are permissible but not all things are beneficial all right the internet the internet is permissible the internet is very useful my sermon notes my sermon notes i type these things up on, on google docs i use the internet as a tool but when you abuse it, when you abuse it, it becomes your master. 
Why would you want your master in your life to be something that is passing away? Rather, pledge yourself to a master who is here and who, who will last forever. Right? Again, again, I want to repeat this again. Time is short. Time is short. Are we in the end times or not? I don't know. But I know this, that time is short. None of us know how much time we have left. And yes, I, I have shared this before. Whether or not the Lord comes back in our lifetime or we go to meet the Lord, we don't know, but our time is short. But look, I'm not going to go down that ex existential debate of how many years that we have left. For today, just for today, just for this moment, put that thought out of your mind. Jason is not talking about how many years you have left because some of you are young. Some of you are very young. And, and wrapping your mind around this idea of how many years you have left is a hard concept to think about when death seems so far away. Just look at today instead. Today, look at how many hours there are in a day. When you look at the number of hours in a day, you start to see Really, that time is short. Think about when you got out of bed. Think about this past week as you get out of bed. If you're not careful, if you're not careful, if, if you're prone to sleeping in, by the next thing you know, next thing you know, by the time that you wake up and roll out of bed, one third of your day has already disappeared. Imagine that, waking up near lunchtime. To have one third of your day already gone. Look, today, if your paycheck arrives and you discover that one third of it is gone, you would be pretty upset. And then you and I might have to sit down and I would explain to you why there's withholdings for taxes and, and health insurance and this and that and FICA. And, but, but let's say, let's say we're not talking about government withholdings. Let's say we're talking about your take-home pay. And one day, you, you open your envelope or whatever, or you check your direct deposit, and you discover that one-third of your take-home pay has disappeared. I think you'd be on the phone right now. I think you'd be on the phone demanding to know, what happened to my money? What did you do with my money? That's a lot of money. One-third of my money gone. What about your time? What about your time? If one third of your time is gone already. And look, when we look at the hours of a day, right? And more often than I would care for, this has happened where I come to the end of the day and I think back on how I've spent the hours of my day. And <coughs> this isn't even, <coughs> this isn't even in the context of one day when I meet the Lord and I have to give an account and I have to give a reckoning and an account of how I spent my day. No, just at the end of the day, as I go to bed, when I look back on today, I like to do this, to, to do a mental run through of what, what did I finish today? What did I accomplish? And more times than I would care for, when I do that at the end of the day, I am unhappy with myself. I am unhappy with how I've used my time. And I'm unhappy because I look and, and this chunk of my day was gone, it's wasted, it's, it's something I'll never get back. And, and then, you know, I should be on the phone demanding to know what happened to my time. I should be on the phone demanding to know what happened to my time, although many times that's what happened to my time. I'm on my phone. You know, this morning before service started, some of us were, were talking and chatting and you know, we were talking about Martin and, and his 100 days of practice on a trumpet. And he's got these lovely videos, one a day. That's discipline. That's awesome. One a day. And we were talking about this. And one brother asked another, have you seen it? And the brother said, oh, no, I haven't. Uh, is it on Facebook? No, it's on Instagram. Oh, uh, that's why I haven't seen it. I'm not on Instagram. Because I'm afraid. I am afraid that if I go there, my time will just be gone. And, and for a lot of us, we understand that, but we go there anyways. We, 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 we try to tread as closely as we can, and next thing you know, two hours of your time has disappeared. Did you know Instagram, the app, will let you track how many hours you stay, you spend on average on the app? I, I don't look at it anymore, because it's scary. It's scary to see how much time is spent there. Time is short. Forget about talking about your life. Just today, Today, this Sunday, what time is it now? It's, it's almost, 
Did I change? It's almost 12 o'clock, right? 11, it's almost 11. Almost a third of our day has passed. What have you done with your morning? Well, you're here this morning worshiping. Good. That's a good use of the day. Now you look ahead at the rest of your day, the hours you have. How are you going to spend it? Our time is short. Whatever lot God has given you in your life, live it with joy and with thanksgiving. And and rather than being more preoccupied than we ought to be with our circumstances, with our station in life, live as one who has been called unto holiness. As the people of God, as children of God, as one who is saved, we are called unto holiness. And and let the things of God, let the matters of the Lord consume you more than the things of this world. Would you, brothers and sisters, can we do that? Can we make that commitment again this morning to say to the Lord, I I surrender, I, I sang it. I've sang it before, I surrender all, but I haven't. Lord, because I spend so much of my time thinking about this, thinking about that, wanting to make this better, wanting to improve that, and the form of this world is passing away. The form of this world is passing away. Why would we, with sanity in our minds, why would we want to invest even more of our precious time our energy, our thoughts, why will we want to invest even more of that into something that's going to be gone? Rather, brothers, sisters, my friends, invest yourself in something that is eternal, in the kingdom of God. Can we do that? If you're married, love your wife as Christ loved the church, yes, but don't let your marriage that relationship consume you. If you own something, all of us own something. Live as though you don't own it. Be free of that. If you are weeping this morning, live as one who doesn't weep. Put your eyes on the Lord. If you're rejoicing, good, we rejoice with you, but don't let that define you. Time is short. Let us live. Let us live this morning as one who is given to the Lord. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that on the cross, you gave of yourself completely for me to redeem me. And so this morning, remind me again, Lord, remind me again and remind all of us through your word that we have been bought at a price that we are no longer our own, that we are slaves to you, our new master. Help us, Jesus. Help us to live as one who is given to you. Help us to live as one who has surrendered to you. Time is short, Jesus. Time is short. Help us to make the most of the hours that we still have left in this day, in this week, in this month, in this year, and in our lifetime. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.